Hello everyone, my name is Monica Ricosi and I'd like to welcome you to the Fashion and Sustainability Summit. The 2020 series is a collaboration of Fashion X and LIM College. The summit is sponsored by Ecolife Yarns, producing sustainable yarns for over 60 years, and our Textiles Limited, specializing in environmentally and socially responsible textiles, and the Accessories Council. Welcome to week 12. We're about to have a conversation on transparency, traceability, and accountability technologies. Today's speakers are Irina Kapatinix of Suji Incorporated, Leonardo Bonani of Source Map Incorporated, Ilka Jordan of Jordan Alliance Group. Today's lead moderator is Michelle Aileen of M Shop NYC. Madison Ross and Rebecca Margolis are co-moderators. At this point, I would like to turn the series over to our lead moderator. Michelle, please take it away. Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome to the summit. I'm so excited to be here today and to be moderating. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my background, and then I'd love to get into this conversation. So um, I've worked in the fashion industry for quite a few years. I don't want to get into how long. Um, and I've pretty much worked in every position that one can hold within the fashion industry. I've worked for small companies, large companies. Um, currently, I'm an adjunct professor at LIM College um, at, and as well as at FIT. I also taught for a few years at Parsons. I, in addition, I do a lot. I own a company called M Shop, and we are consultants, and we help brands launch and grow. So we can help with any aspects. We have workshops. We consult one-on-one -on -one with packages, and we sell products. So I'm here to help, and uh, my passion is definitely supply chain and sustainability. Hence, I'm right here. So welcome, everyone. Um, and again, I'd love to introduce the panels, panelists and let them tell you a little bit about themselves. So Ilka, Jordan, can you tell us about yourself? Yes. Um, so yes, I'm Ilka Jordan. I am CEO and founder of Jordan Alliance Group. Um, I spent the majority of my career in the fashion industry, uh, working with specialty retailers and global brands. Um, all of the roles that I've uh, played in and the projects that I've been involved in were mainly to operationalize uh, major corporate uh, cost saving initiatives, uh, which involve technology implementations, um, business process re engineering, and also um, enterprise change management efforts to support um, organizational alignment and adoption. Uh, the goals uh, were to increase profitability by creating operational efficiencies across the supply chain, uh, reduce costs, waste, and time. Um, Irina, can you tell us what you do at Suchi Inc.? Sure. My background is a little different from most because I spent the better part of the last two decades driving top line sales and revenue growth for major Fortune 500 companies. Uh, in the financial services space. Um, but I am actually, uh, over the last couple of years, I invested in Suchi Inc. and I'm a senior exec there. I'm the VP of marketing. And Suchi Inc. is a supply chain management platform that really is digitizing and revolutionizing the supply chain for businesses across hundreds of industries, but obviously fashion being a huge focus for us. I uh, work with many size companies from startups to enterprise companies. I'm also the host of the Suchi podcast and there our focus is really on the importance of embracing digital supply chains and how today's top business leaders are really driving change across their organizations as early adopters of supply chain technology. Um, Leonardo, tell us about yourself and SourceMap. Hi, uh, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm the founder of SourceMap. It's a software company we have the, the task of uh, helping brands uh, figure out what their supply chain actually is uh, all the way to the raw materials and, and that all the practices that they uh, have standards for are, are actually uh, in place. And then we, we also help some of the more courageous brands uh, then communicate their supply chain transparently to, to consumers. And so you'll see uh, companies like like VF's uh, Timberland and North Face and Vans and, and Hershey and Mars and others uh, publishing a map of, of uh, where they uh, buy stuff from all the way to the, to the farms uh, on our website. 
So that's what I do. So welcome all of you. All right, let's get it started. Um, it seems as though if brands and suppliers were more sustainable in their practices, transparency, traceability, and accountability would not be such hot topics. So my question is threefold. Um, why are we still in this predicament of not being able to transition to cleaner practices in the fashion industry? That's one part. Um, is it merely about profit without ethics for most companies and their bottom lines? And how do we get firms to embrace transparency? Anyone can start. I, I can jump in. Um, I, you know, I used to think companies weren't transparent because they were embarrassed of, of something that they knew about. And then we re realized the problem was much worse than it was that they generally, the fashion supply chains for big companies are changing so fast that they have very little control over who they buy from. So there's good uh, accounting for some of the sustainability happening in the first tier suppliers, but there's almost nothing beyond that, especially not down to the raw material. So, uh, you know, what we've really struggled and, and, and recently become successful in doing is convincing them that, you know, that if they could just talk to their suppliers more often using social platforms like like ours then they could actually get to a place where they're comfortable enough to share and to be transparent about their supply chain um, i can go next Irina, yeah. i i think that the reason why we're still in a transition period is because every company defines sustainability differently the word is very broad and can mean different things to different brands. So we need to look at sustainability as a spectrum. And it really depends on where a company falls within that spectrum. Um, brands need to become more clear as well in terms of what their sustainability goals are and back that up with transparency. Um, it has to be a stepwise function and it's, it's not something that can happen overnight. A company can't really go from no transparency to 100% visibility steps need to be taken to reach their goals and defining those steps along the way. I think implementing software and technology can really help increase visibility internally, but more importantly, pass on that data-backed information to the end customer. Ilka, anything to add to that? Um, for a company to uh, be transparent, um, they have to know what's happening um, up and downstream their supply chain. Uh, the companies we work with, they may know their uh, first tier suppliers, but they truly need to know um, where their, you know, the fibers are being made, where um, their uh, materials are from, and the components. And it was difficult to, when you're working with a supplier who's working with another supplier, sub-supplier, to, to really map that out and, and have true transparency. Uh, so today, the new, the new word transparency is all about um, different levels of visibility. Uh, flexibility and agility in their supply chain. And um, this would help them understand who they're really working with at all tiers. And then to be able to share that, um, the knowledge that they gain from that, they need to establish KPIs that their suppliers and vendors are all um, um, driving towards. Um, also, some of the things that we talk about with our clients is to provide you know, frameworks for um, monitoring it. And then also working closely with their suppliers. So once they understand who they're working with and they've streamlined um, it to the ones that are really um, going forward with sustainability practices, um, you know, to build a really strong relationship with them and help them um, improve on their sustainability practices. Um, and then, you know, to maintain that relationship is uh, to, you know, reward them. So uh, your main suppliers who are really doing a good, you know, good progress, you know, give them, um, extend a contract or, you know, a preferred status. And I think this will help them sustain um, that transparency, uh, which is really important, um, especially, you know, as they uh, link it up to all areas of their um, operating model. Do you all feel that end fashion consumers today really care enough about transparency, traceability, and accountability for the seismic shift that's required to transform the industry? Do consumers care? I would say um, most definitely they care, um, but it really depends because the first step for any brand is to understand who their target audience is 
and what is it that they care about and what's important to them, really identifying that and understanding who that buyer is, who's the consumer. Mm -hmm. Consumers today are definitely more in tune with the companies that align with their beliefs and that are making steps to support that. They want to see that the brands that they're buying um, are not just saying they do it, but showing they do it. And this is evident in so many brands that are successful because they've married this ethos into everything that they do. You look at a company like Patagonia that was one of the earliest defenders of environmental ethics in activewear fashion. Um, Eileen Fisher is another industry leader in ethical and sustainable fashion. By 2025, I think they're saying they want to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that are created during manufacturing process by 25%. Um, Bowdoin is another company that again, is very committed to responsible sourcing, fair trade and ethical practices. So, I mean, I think it, 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 it like I mentioned in that first, in the first question, it really is a sliding scale. So, you know, different areas within sustainability are important to uh, different brands and it all ties back to who their consumer is and, and who they're connecting with. Thank you for that response. Um... Leonardo, you're smiling. Would you like to chime in on that? Um, I, you know, we would love it for consumers to be driving this, uh, but uh, the biggest driver we've seen so far are internal company uh, uh, motivations. So how, how to get the best talent, keep the best talent, get, get the whole company uh, to come together around uh, social environmental goals. So what we're seeing actually in the companies that uh, are going radically transparent is that they're doing it ahead of consumer demand as just a way to set uh, a new benchmark and frankly one that they know their competition can't match and they're using it really to set themselves apart to get better talent to get better financing and then they hope that that creates a dynamic that one day consumers will respond to although consumers are busy with a lot of messaging so it's they're often not as a, as able to get into the weeds of the supply chain as, as we would like. Ilka, anything to add? I most definitely think consumers are definitely uh, interested in uh, transparency. They, they want to work with uh, companies who have a sustainability um, conscious organization. They want to know where they're getting their, where they're manufacturing their products, um, what the content is about, and who they're manufacturing with, uh, whether there's uh, ethical um, working conditions there and, and so on. So they're driving the, definitely the acceleration of more companies um, um, tying in sustainability goals into the way they operate all through their, um, their supply chain. I, I like the three perspectives there. One, the consumers are driving. One, the industry is driving the consumers, and then the other, we have to understand who the consumers are. Wonderful. Um, all right, let's move on to another question. I have to ask about COVID, right? It's the, I guess, the topic of the day right now. Um, how has COVID affected transparency? Um, do you all find that there's more of a desire from industry to shift in this direction because of the pandemic? So yeah, definitely uh, COVID has uh, accelerated um, uh, most of the companies going uh, full steam ahead in their um, sustainability initiatives, um, mainly because uh, people are now working from home. Companies big focus is now on the technology that can help them um, continue to be efficient in what they do. And that also drives them to look at emerging technologies that can help them um, you know, enable their sustainability. Um, so one of the things that we've, during this time, we really looked at how uh, more companies are um, adopting you know, different technologies that can help them um, increase their efficiencies, give them better visibility, and also reduce the carbon footprint because that's that tie-in. Um, and so there are a few like uh, artificial intelligence that's being used uh, for advanced um, information processing. There's also augmented and virtual reality um, that's used in the front end of uh, the supply chain. And that um, can reduce carbon footprint by just uh, negating the need to travel to see samples or to work with them. 
um, Internet of Things, everyone's uh, been hearing a lot about that. that. That helps with the traceability by being able to uh, identify certain um, key elements of uh, a, a product as it moves throughout your supply chain. And also, um, you know, the biggest thing, which, which is not new because it, it's been out for a while, but more on a, in a different industry, but blockchain. And that's going to be the real driver of um, traceability and, and to be able to rely on the information and know that it's um, not going to change and it's what you see is what you get and be able to trace uh, your products all the way through. And then also 3D printing, which is something really big in the design, um, designing of the products. Irina, do you have anything to add to that as you're uh, more of a technology-based company, uh, correct? Sure. I mean, tying into what Ilka said, with COVID, I mean, it most definitely um, has caused a shift in the industry. I think that um, just taking that work from home aspect and people now having to work in different places, having some sort of unifying technology that really still connects your supply chain and doesn't allow for disruption is super important. Uh, a lot of businesses have seen their supply chains, just the participants kind of fall apart due to the global impact of the pandemic. I mean, you had factories shutting down, raw materials were hard to come by, orders weren't being fulfilled. So many companies were left with little or no inventory and it's been devastating. We've seen so many brands and retailers shutting down. Um, one of the hottest topics in the industry today is digitization of the supply chain. It's because you know, through technology, these companies can protect their supply chains. They can create transparency and visibility, um, but at the same time, really set up those backup solutions for events like these that can cripple a business. Such. Yeah, I can build on these, uh, the last two points. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but we, we've just noticed that if, if people were only mapping their supply chains for sustainability before COVID, uh, or they were being up, you know, up at night because they were worried about labor practices. Now, a lot more people at our, our customers are are staying up at night because they're worried about the, the supply chains lasting and being able to continue to work, especially in the beginning when they weren't sure if their suppliers were able to operate or not. So I, I find at least mapping the supply chain has really taken off during COVID uh, for, any, for any number of reasons, including the, the ones that you just heard. Uh, and that's probably the most important step towards sustainability, although it's not always being done you know, for the sake of sustainability. Greenwashing there, huh? <sighs> we hope not. Um, I'd love to hear a little more about how all of your companies work, um, specifically to achieve accountability and traceability, you know, what we're talking about here. What's your consumer's end deliverable that signifies um, how you're going to achieve accountability or how they will. Um, so you know, Jordan Alliance is a consulting firm and, um, and we, we coin ourselves as being at the forefront of uh, fashion retail supply chain sustainability and transformation towards a um, uh, circular economy. Uh, we hear that a lot um, with our clients. We, we work on a strategic level with them. And so in their initiatives, we hear sustainability a lot. But um, what we don't do or see is how it's tying into some of those sustainable goals. So a part of what we do is work with our clients to uh, demystify fashion circularity. And it starts with transforming our collective mindsets to see waste and disposability as a design flaw. So that's one. So now embracing uh, new materials and technologies that restore and regenerate we're eliminating costly waste, reducing pollution, and inspiring a culture of corporate responsibility. So in short, we're making purpose profitable. Um, and we do this uh, by incorporating, um, uh, looking at their sustainability initiatives and incorporating those uh, concepts, you know, profit, people, planet, into their strategies and their value chains, um, the way they engage with their customers and their organizational structure. So then they get a big picture of how uh, they're working, the, the activities that they're doing, how they are supporting the sustainability goals that they're re trying to you know, um, achieve. Irina, would you like to partake in that question? Um, sure. So uh, 
our software, the Suchi Grid, is really a modular-based software that connects the entire supply chain from design all the way through to distribution. So through our factory vendor and freelancer assignments within the grid, there's complete visibility into what each supply chain participant is accountable for. With everyone communicating and working on one platform, you can easily identify where bottlenecks occur and where your supply chain is the weakest. Um, because all the data from the design all the way through distribution flows through one platform, the robust reporting and analytics that we have is truly like a game changer for a lot of brands. So all the information that flows through across your entire supply chain can be sliced and diced in a way that gives a brand a really unique look at the state of their business and helps them against competition and really positions them against competition. Um, at the click of a button, you can see if deadlines are missed or if there's a specific stage that continues to always be delayed. You can really quickly identify where issues lie within your supply chain and then optimize for the future. That's incredible. How about you, Leonardo? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, source map is for these companies that are trying to go from, you know, just, just understanding their uh, direct suppliers all the way to full visibility down to the to the raw material so they use the software a lot like a social network like linkedin they invite their suppliers who invite their suppliers who invite their suppliers and so uh, gradually they build out a social network uh, of, of thousands of companies all the way to the to the farms uh, and then they collect data continuously from all of these uh, stakeholders on uh, compliance social practices environmental practices um, and then finally, we also verify all this data. Uh, you know, if it's uh, leather, we'll, we'll look to make sure that the cattle's not being ranched near uh, deforested areas. If it's uh, uh, cotton, we'll make sure that the water use is, is within norms. And so there's a lot of uh, risk and geographic information that we use to, to provide assurance. And then we actually trace every transaction. So if you want to say this is a responsibly sourced piece of wool or down or leather or cotton uh, we actually have every single receipt to prove that it was bought from an organic farm or it was bought from a certified tannery and we we run that verification continuously because our customers want to be transparent so they don't want to be uh, sharing stories that aren't actually verified and so that's that's where we help and then at the end if they if they get through all of that which which more and more companies are doing then they publish it online as well and consumers can find out more. So your your um, personnel has to actually uh, put boots down on the ground and go on to properties and inspect and check the farming. Um, and it's a it's a very you have to physically audit. Is that how that works? No, it, it, not no. I, in fact, um, a lot of our customers already have audits and certifications in place. What they're looking for the problem is you can't audit everybody every day, and you can't certify um, everyone and everybody knows when the auditors come and the certifiers visit anyways so they can make things look good for them what we do is more like what your credit card company does and uh looking at patterns of transactions you know is this farm producing too much organic cotton for the size is this factory hiring enough people to produce that many units of clothing and when we see patterns that go out of whack and we can't reconcile the books that's when we alert uh our customers that there might be a problem there uh, and by the same token for those suppliers that are doing a great job we 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 put them all on a benchmark and we let our customers uh essentially decide how to reward the, the best performers and what actions what corrective actions to take when they find fraud um i don't want to get too nosy but i am interested in um generally what the percentage would be that your services would add to maybe a product's retail? Is there any way to gauge that or get an idea um, of cost? I'm, I'm thinking of smaller brands. I work a lot with smaller emerging brands and I'm wondering you know, how they need to be budgeted for, for something like this um, because your services sound incredible. So is there any way to just gauge, I don't know, any, any where you are in terms of a percentage of, of what that would add to the cost of product all right i can start we we, we um you know we have a free software for for small brands which is uh, called open source map and and anyone who knows their supply chain and wants to be transparent can use that 
uh, that's the easy end of the of the price scale. On the, on the other end, uh, essentially what we're trying to do is take a, a responsible sourcing person and enable them to monitor uh, 10,000 factories if they only were able to monitor 100 before. So you can think of it in terms of adding uh, uh, a little bit to a headcount, but enabling that person to do 10 times as much work. Irina? Sure. Um, we're actually launching a freemium version on our website over the next couple of months as well. But uh, really the pricing varies across different sizes of companies and depending on the business life cycle and then how many modules they're going to use in the scope of their business. But for smaller companies, we tend to be the complete tech stack. For larger companies, we integrate with their current tech stack to create a complete solution, which we it's like sort of a one source of truth for, for their entire supply chain. But our customers definitely see a tremendous ROI, no matter what stage of business they are. Um, across our customer base, we've seen an average of 50% faster speed to market because digitizing a manual process will increase the turnaround times across each stage of the product life cycle. We've also seen up to 15% reduction in cost of goods sold and overhead. Um, companies can improve net margins by optimizing job responsibilities, creating smart assignments to vendors and factories, and with the data back forecasting and analytics. Um, lastly, we've digitized workflows anywhere from 10 to 95%, which really takes a lot of those on-premise tasks to off-location software functions. How about you, Ilka? You know, most of the work that we do is working with uh, corporations on strategies on how to um, become more efficient to to realize the cost savings that um, they can then put back into um, the, the customer or the price of their, their products. Um, but that's pretty much what we do really in the, the internal and then the global ways of working with their suppliers. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you for were you saying more? I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Great. Wonderful answers. I'm going to hand it off to Madison Ross, who's going to pose some questions as well. Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for speaking on all the realms when it comes to traceability, accountability, and transparency. I was, I was snapping my fingers <laughs> trying to contain myself of like how relatable it is in my position as a supply chain coordinator, um, especially when Ilka mentioned building the relationship with the supplier and especially getting in like up to your shoulders deep and understanding the second and third tier of suppliers, which Kathy has a question regarding to um, what do you see best in the way of communicating um, the su sustainability and trans traceability data regarding such relations or communications a company is holding with such suppliers in the second and third tier? This question could be out for anyone or? I'll just say that um, for us being that we um, rate our vendors um, according to many, many different categories and factors, um, you know, for us, it's really a matter of preference uh, for the brand and for the company. So it, it really doesn't matter to us how they want to rate them. Um, it's a matter of what the company's ethos is. So um, we, we can rate on all of those factors and um, that's available, but um, it really depends on the business. Yeah, and I, I can second that. I mean, every one of our customers has a different benchmark and a different standard and different targets that they're trying to live up to. So they come up with their own calculus, but it is usually a, a triple bottom line. So how, how reliably are they delivering uh, so time and, and cost, how environmentally friendly, and that is both qualitative like certifications and quantitative, like how much water, how much CO2. And then finally, social compliance, which has actually become the most important uh, because of various customs uh, and regulations, where they're really trying to figure out, you know, what are they doing for payroll, for grievance mechanisms, for uh, ensuring there's no underage workers. And so there's usually some combination of those three categories. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely agree that it depends on the mold of the company as well as their relationship with the supplier. Everyone's different, whether they be a small business or a large corporation. Just how like Arena uh, mentioned, uh, there's a spectrum to sustainability. There's a spectrum to how one goes about such sustainability and how they speak with their supplier. So I definitely agree with you. 
Um, we have another question from Ashley asking about the ripple effect um, as companies who go more accountable, um, become more accountable for their practices, how can we ensure that what's made as accountable for the company is exactly the same as the supplier? Like, for example, I'm guessing what Ashley's referring to is what may be more responsible for the company may not be in the best um, circumstance for the supplier. I, how can, uh, like, how can we uh, uh, ensure we avoid such? Like, what's being held accountable is best for both the company as well as the supplier. I, I can answer that. Um, I think that it's there's a couple there's a couple ways to look at it. I mean, I think. Obviously, it could be driven by the consumer in terms of really uh, buying brands that are sustainable, are you know fitting the ethos of what they're interested in or what there's, what's important to them, and that you know helps drive the behavior of how a brand interacts and, and works and reports out to their consumer. Um, I also think that. What, what I said before, it's not about just saying you're doing it, but proving you're doing it and having data backed reporting that can be put out there in a, in a way that consumers can engage and understand is, is also really important too. So it, it, it has to tie back to the brand actually believing in it and really wanting to take those principles on as a company. First of all, it also ties into the consumer and how they're buying and who they're buying from and making those decisions from a consumer standpoint. And then, you know, if a brand does decide to do it, it's about how they're able to say that they're doing it and prove it. No, I definitely agree um, in terms of there has to be a sense of uniformity all throughout the supply chain, even to the consumer of having a clear picture of, uh, I guess, the end goal here, like, um, in order to achieve initial goals of ensuring supplier and other goals of the company is achieved, there needs to be some clarity and some uniformity and communication to the customer of like, in order for us to get A, we still need to consider X, Y, and Z for this. So I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just add, you know, I don't know a lot of companies yet that really put teeth uh, on their sustainability benchmarks. So how many of them won't work with a supplier that doesn't meet their standards. But I, we've only seen this happen if, if uh, suppliers get rewarded, uh, if, if they you know, take on a, a leading role in sustainability and, and also there's some risk on the downside. So there's, there's, uh, we, we, we have to leverage the commercials of the supply chain to drive this change. And the companies that are leading the way are definitely incentivizing their suppliers to follow in their footsteps. Yeah, there's definitely like a tango between the communication with the consumers versus maintaining a sustainable relationship with the supplier. Um, regarding to both Leonardo and Irina or and also Elka's uh, way of, I guess, of building lean thinking in a Six Sigma sense of, uh, of thinking when it comes to tracking um, um, situations going on with suppliers. How has it been affected by COVID? Like, has there been any <laughs> trends regarding, say, specific situations as, I guess, what Leonardo mentioned, benchmarking um, throughout the past uh, few months um, of COVID? Like, has there been any trends or problem, like specific problems um, suppliers have faced? and have um, your clients or partners or companies you've been working with uh, gone about, I guess, from working with suppliers versus communicating it? When I could start, I guess the, the Six Sigma is kind of, uh, it's like one in a million uh, error rate. And I think we were seeing, you know, one in two companies having a major disruption. So it's, it's uh, I think for the first time, we definitely saw companies say, hey, you know, the fact that I don't know who supplies my suppliers, is, is causing me to have to shut down for a week or a month or to not be able to produce this entire product line. And so they're, they're really um, leap, leapfrogging, I guess, and digitizing very quickly, finding out who their suppliers are and what the risks are. Uh, 
a lot because of COVID. Right, I'd like to jump in. Um, we, we always feel one of the key enablers for any company to either leapfrog or, or start taking baby steps into sustainability is uh, the people in their organization um, are the key to that effective change. Uh, sustainability needs to be a part of the organizational culture. And, and that's really where they need to start is make sure that they provide clear uh, vision of the company that that's where they're, they're committed to go towards. Everyone in the organization has a play within that. Um, so in order for them to be able to um, uh, um, align to it and, and commit to it, uh, they need to see that there's buy-in from the top and, and I know everyone understands this intellectually, but we need to actually um, see the people at the top really committing to uh, going forward in that way. And then to drive the effort um, with a um, what's in it for me perspective. Uh, and, and that would help the organization uh, transition uh, smoothly. And, and then make sure that there's a governance in place that supports uh, that transition. Employees will need to be supported um, throughout the process of that change. And, and I think that's key. That's where companies need to start and then with um, um, really exploring what they already have and, and using that more efficiently. So they got to look into their business processes. A lot of times when they pivot to do something differently, um, they don't um, really look at what it takes, you know, clear processes that will make sure that everyone's going down that road um, the same way and, and, and meet, meet those goals uh, um, more effectively. Yeah, okay, I definitely believe there is a learning curve, like you can't just simply just pivot as much as one would love to, but there's going to be a learning curve depending how long it may take for all realms of the supply chain to latch on and get with a new program of accountability. So I think with that, I'll bring it to Rebecca. I believe she has a few questions from the um, more participants. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca. I am the uh, sustainability coordinator intern at Fashion Dex, and I'm going to be fielding some questions. So first, I'm actually going to call on Jean if you wanted to ask your question. Are you referring to me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I thought someone wanted to ask me a question, but I'm, I will ask a question to this esteemed panel. Thank you all I, uh, for allowing me to join you. I'm particularly interested in circularity as applied to traceability um, in various vertical industries. I'm, we're particularly focused on program managing the effort currently in the fiber apparel textile space. And we're um, seeing uh, maybe what some folks are describing as on what we call an onboarding synergistic onboarding exercise that's going on right now because there have been just a number of uh, companies very deeply involved with clients uh, just uh, such as source map and so forth using um, uh, deeply managed uh, mapping technology um, on a subscribed basis, but then there are also initiatives happening globally that are in a more public space. And I'm looking at interesting ideas around incentivization for onboarding traceability through a supply chain based upon, uh, let's call them financial models, uh, incentivized financial models that are uh, ex externally include public um, uh, kinds of processes like uh, taxation, tariff uh, regulation, and also the adoption of standards like the GS1 standard across uh, with specific interest in traceability and circular design. So if those, I know that's a lot of words, but uh, I'm very interested in the circularity and the public interfaces to traceability that incentivize. Uh, I, I can just speak to two things that we know uh, uh, work, and, and one is if, if, if legislation comes together, because right now the companies that are doing the best sustainability work are being punished by having higher costs because all of their competitors can get by without investing as much. So if the laws get passed, then the companies that are sustainable will finally have the same burden as the others, and in fact, less of a burden because they've been doing it longer and they could do it more efficiently. So that's one thing is legislation. 
The other one is, you know, we're very active in the cocoa sector and there there's a premium paid uh, for a traceable uh, ton of cocoa. It's a hefty premium compared to a non uh, a traceable one. And the industry has already moved more than half of their buying to the traceable ones. So it, it has had a, a enormous impact. So I, I would say uh, the one being regulation is probably the biggest driver of investment in traceable supply chains. And the other is, is premiums uh, by companies as, a, as an industry. Does anybody else want to chime in? Okay, perfect. I'm actually going to pass it back over to Madison. That's sweet because we've got a whole lot more questions. Everyone's very interested in to dive into supply chain especially. Um, we have a question from Manaka um, asking, is it becoming easier to find and collaborate with responsible ethical and certified vendors and suppliers? Are there, are there global certifying bodies? That's a good question. I feel like, are do you feel they're just growing or more suppliers or I'll add on to the question as to are suppliers growing or trans more transferring their practices into more sustainable sustainable um, practices? I would say it's a little of both and I would also say that with the current pandemic so much has shifted. Um, we work with over 600 factories and vendors, raw material suppliers across the globe so um, we've seen a lot of change over the last six months um, where, you know, some of the smaller uh, factories or raw material suppliers haven't been able to survive. There's also just longer term, we're seeing shifts in, in terms of having and implementing more sustainable practices in the way that they are, um, you know, creating and making these goods. But in, in a lot of, parts of the world, it's just very difficult for that to happen. So there are others that are just not able to make that much of a seismic shift. Um, and, it, and again, it really, really depends on their, uh, who's buying from them and what the demands are on them. Because a lot of times it is, you know, their customers that um, help drive change. I didn't know if anyone else had to chime in. But I definitely think uh, going on to your point, how it's a tango between their survival or their success. The suppliers depends on uh, indirectly or directly the consumer. And so it's an interesting uh, relationship, not only between the company and the supplier, but also the supplier and the c consumer. Um, we have a question from Sylvie um, asking about if there's any recommended uh, tool clients or any partners you may have to calculate their impact to know better about their priorities. I feel like this would have to do with depend on their, the company itself and the size of it, but if you have any advice on that. Um, so one of the things that we do at Jordan Alliance group is that we when we work with our clients and there are um, other you know new business models that really focus in on helping them monitor you know what they're at are they sustainable and, and kind of you know map it or compare it to a benchmark we then bring those um, companies into the fold so they could create these networks and really understand you know, the, the whole the true circularity of it so they could um, not own that part with people who have done working so that's what that's what, what we would recommend to anybody who wants to understand um, you know how they are performing in that realm is to really partner with those organizations who have those tools. There's one that's uh, on um, the uh, LM authors um, website, um, and and that's a tool that is being uh, used as a standard now. Um, so I recommend everyone going there to to look at that first. But then there's others uh, that are emerging that's coming up. So our job is to do that research and offer those um, resources up to our clients. But yeah, amazing. I really do like what you have to say in terms of advice for clients. Um, Elka, I have a question for you regarding, say, I was on your website and looked onto your blog page, and I really did like your 
I think it was a post in July. Yeah, I, I dug, but I'm subscribed now. Um, I had a question regarding, say, you wrote a, or your team wrote a post on greenwashing. And I feel like we all have an understanding what greenwashing and what it brings to in the multitudes it can impact on. Um, do you have any advice uh, for your clients or partners um, to maintain, say, follow through or bringing their actions to words? Um, or what do you do to ensure such clients or partners um, stick to their words, basically? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we do a lot of posts. We do a lot of research on, um, you know, practices and the bad practices with uh, what's happening here in the retail industry. Um, but the advice we say, is, and, and this is something that we, we all know, a company um, cannot be considered as sustainable. Um, and we know that if they're not having a positive, if they're not measuring their impact on the, the principles and the concept of sustainability. So in order for you to truly claim that you're, you're sustainable, um, you have to be able to uh, see what your impacts are on, on people, on the society, and, and the planet. So when you want to claim that you are and not greenwash is to um, really show that and communicate it out, not only uh, internally, but you know externally, uh, so everyone could um, go down that journey with you and be informed. Amazing. Thank you. Um, I guess my last question for everyone would be if there's any advice you have for brands or partners or any kind of a clientele, um, what advice or lasting advice would you have, especially in today's COVID, of how to maintain more accountability, more transparency, um, any, I guess, advice that sums up what you've all been discussing here today with us. And I guess we can start with Leonardo. Okay, so um, the advice that I would have to uh, companies um, transitioning out of you know the, the, the state that we're in now, so let's say post COVID, uh, even though we're not there yet, is to not go back to the old ways of working. They've learned so much during this time and, and they've picked up some good practices uh, to work more efficiently, to work with technology more efficiently. And also, you know, not everyone needs to go back into the office. So um, to go back to your new normal, only bringing those things that really work for you and work for your company and allowed you to move forward. And any of those activities that you've done or that you were really um, feeling like it, it, it provided value, but, but you really can't prove it, leave those out. And, and only go forward with a more streamlined way of working and, um, and more using technology um, in, in a new different way. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I can go next. Uh, I would just say, go, uh, it's, it's never too uh, early to start. So if you're not uh, transparent as a brand, whether you're small or big, uh, it, it's something that's gonna become, either your competitors are gonna do it or it's gonna become a requirement of doing business. So start, start mapping your supply chain, start measuring, you know, tier two, tier three uh, now before it becomes uh, something that you uh, have to do at, at much greater expense. I, I would just add to that, that, you know, uh, in the, the last, you know, 10 years, we've seen companies really try to remove costs, remove costs from their supply chain and really go the low cost route. And I think that now with everything that happened with the pandemic, um, we're focusing on not only um, you know, adding back some more costs because we need to diversify and we need to protect our supply chain. So having multiple suppliers, having multiple uh, manufacturers is not a bad idea. Um, you know, I think that a lot of what we're gonna also be seeing is um, a lot more nearshoring. I think that's another, another factor that's gonna come into play for items that people will pay a premium for. We can't nearshore everything, it's just not possible. But for the items that someone will pay a premium for, I think we're gonna see a lot more coming back to the United States. And then lastly, I would say obviously digitization. I mean, from a software perspective, 
um, being able to connect all those disconnected participants has never been um, more important than it is right now with uh, people not only working from home, but um, just the changes that we're seeing in the way all of our vendor participants even operate. I mean, I think that it's really important to create that real-time communication, that, uh, you know, the, the traceability, the transparency that we've been talking about this whole time, and, and the accountability amongst the partners, because I think that more so than ever, we're going to be looking to our left and our right and who comes in line in terms of the workflow of our supply chain and making sure that everyone's doing what they're supposed to before it moves to the next step. And that's one of the only ways to do that now. Mm, really great advice from every one of you. I'm going to bring this back to Michelle for final remarks and final questions. Thank you all. Amazing. Amazing. Um, incredible responses and insights. Um, this has been so exciting to moderate and to listen and, and hear all of the um, responses. I'm just wondering if you all think that it's transparency or bust. Do you feel like that is the direction we're moving into? If you're not on board, you're Darwinized, you're done. Is that any of your thoughts? Yeah, no question. You, you couldn't, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, it's going to be, it already is the law for a lot of industries. It's coming around the corner. Uh, there's, there's really no, no benefit from waiting. I really you know, totally agree. Totally agree. Agree? I totally agree as well. Wonderful. Okay. That's so exciting to hear. Thank you for making my day. Um, this was an incredible panel. Um, thanks to all three of you. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, thank you, Andrea, um, Rebecca, Madison. This was incredible. I guess I'll hand it um, back over so we can close it out to Monica. But again, thanks so much. This was an incredible topic. Michelle, and if I could just, before Monica goes off, um, if everyone could just, tell the attendees where to find you or if they're interested, if you could each plug yourselves, um, everyone please. And then Monica will take it away. Sure, our website is just www.suchi.com. That's S-U-U-C-H-I. And our website is jordanalliance.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-A-L-L-I-A-N-C-E. And uh, you could also so reach us on uh, LinkedIn, and um, that's Jordan Alliance. Doc, I mean Jordan Alliance Group, and then me, Elka Jordan. Looking forward to connecting. Feel free to reach out and, and browse also all the all the transparent companies we have. Uh, our website is SourceMap.com, and I'm Leo at SourceMap. Wonderful. Thank you all. I'd like to thank the speakers, the moderators, the attendees, and a big thank you to our sponsors: EcoLife Yarns, Kendor Textiles Limited and the Accessories Council. If anyone is interested in becoming a sponsor, please reach out to myself. My name is Monica, or Juanis, or Gladys. You can find our email and information at fashiondex.com. And while you're at fashiondex.com, click on the tab store. You can find the latest and most updated books and online sources. Please sign up and join us next week, week 13. We're going to be having a conversation on sustainability at Allbirds. The lead speaker will be Anna Kajumara, the manager of sustainability at Allbirds. Lead moderator will be Jordana Guillamaras of Fashion Innovation, and co-moderators will be Juliet Jones of LIM College and Rebecca Margolis of Fashion Dex. A sneak peek at week 14, we'll be having a conversation with influencers on brand management, equity, and sustainability at, in fashion. The speakers include Eddie Rodman Jr. Uh, of Rodman Enterprises PR and Brand Management, and Valerie Excuvan of Onicurve. That's all for today. See you next week and have a wonderful day.